Hi, my name is Nick Susi, and I'm filming from my studio at University of South Carolina, where I'm assistant professor of piano. I'm here to talk about Franz Liszt's piano transcription of Recitative in Romance, or Evening Star, from Wagner's opera Tannhäuser. In this video today, we'll be going over some of the main features of this piece, focusing on those that will help us perform it well. First, I'll be discussing some background information on both Liszt's transcription and Wagner's opera. Following that, we'll take a closer look at each of the two large sections alluded to in the work's title, Recitative and Romance. In each of those sections, I'll begin by stating a philosophical issue or problem with the piece itself. We'll take a look at those issues and allow the discussion to inform our ensuing decision-making as pianists. In the recitative, that will be about what a pianist is to do with text of music like opera transcriptions. And in the romance, we'll discuss the differing approaches of recreating versus reimagining. Both of these concerns are genre-wide issues, so it's my hope that those tuning in today will find this video helpful not just for Evening Star, but also for any other song or opera transcriptions they approach in the future. I'll conclude by stating again what I'll state now, which is that this piece is an excellent teaching choice for early advanced pianists. We often think of list transcriptions as being prohibitively difficult for young pianists, but I'll attempt to show here why this is not the case with this particular piece. And before we dive into the piece's background, I'd like to give one quick word about additions. In this presentation, any musical text is taken from the public domain 1917 Pater's edition by Emil von Sauer. If you're interested in acquiring your own edition, the one I'd recommend as definitive would be the new list edition pictured here on the right. To give a quick overview of the genre of solo piano transcriptions of operatic and song literature, Liszt really pioneered in this genre. These pieces were really the stock and trade of the touring virtuoso pianist, which Liszt we know did. They were also a way for him to popularize music by composers he really respected, like Schubert and Wagner. Also, they did fantastically well in the marketplace. Um, this allowed folks to enjoy at home the tunes that they heard at the opera the previous evening or the previous week. They could, for the brave ones, uh, try them out at home on their salon piano. As I mentioned, Liszt really wanted to popularize composers that he respected. One of these composers is Wagner, who he had not just a professional relationship with, but a personal relationship as well. Wagner ended up marrying Liszt's daughter Cosima, and so they had a particularly tight bond together as father and son-in-law. Wagner wrote Tannhäuser in 1845, and Liszt followed up with his solo piano transcription of this number in 1849. Liszt transcribed a few other numbers from the opera too, including the Pilgrim's Chorus, which precedes Evening Star in the opera and also serves as a nice back-to-back -back pairing in concert with Evening Star. Probably most famously, Liszt transcribed the opera's Overture, a long piece with huge technical demands. Unfortunately, we don't have time to take a close look at the opera's plot, so I'll only mention here the main themes of the opera that will be relevant to our discussion of Evening Star. The main ideas given in the opera are very common ones for Wagner. First, Wagner presents love in two opposing ways, a spiritual, true version versus love as carnal desire. Next, a favorite idea of Wagner's on clear display here is ultimate redemption through love, especially involving the redemption of a man through the death or sacrifice of a woman. And lastly, with talk of spirituality and redemption, it's important to note that Christian faith itself plays a large role in this opera. All these themes are intertwined with Evening Star, which is sung by Wolfram about Elizabeth in the final act of the opera. Pictured here is Peter Matei as Wolfram in a 2015 performance of Tannhäuser at the Met. This performance is available to view through Met Opera On Demand. Let's take a look at the numbers text. It's crucial for a pianist to know what's taking place and what's being said in order to properly capture the expression of the transcription. In my intro, I stated this is an excellent choice as a teaching piece. One reason I think so is because of the specificity and immediacy of opera or song's narrative and meaning. The text tells you exactly what's going on in the music. Pre-college students might struggle to grasp the meaning or interpretation in pieces of absolute music, but in cases like Evening Star, the interpretive heavy lifting, so to speak, is already completed for us. That clarity can be freeing for a young student who might feel like they never know the quote-unquote right answer or who wish they didn't have to rely on their teacher to tell them exactly how to interpret a piece. 
Some students may like the interpretive freedom of more open pieces, but others may feel baffled by it or disengage. The first half of the text here is found in the recitative. The first four lines, dust covers the land like a premonition of death, wraps the valley in her dark mantle. The soul that longs for those heights dreads to take its dark and awful flight. So here in the recitative, we have imagery surrounding uh, darkness, fear, death, and even geographically kind of low down imagery with the valley. This is countered then with the next four lines. Then you appear, O loveliest of stars, and shed your gentle light from afar. Your sweet glow cleaves the twilight gloom, and as a friend you show the way out of the valley. So the recitative ends with different imagery, that of light, hope, and even geographically high up imagery with the star. And here's the text for the second half of the piece, the romance. O oh, you, my fair evening star, gladly have I always greeted you. Greet her from the depths of this heart, which has never betrayed her. Greet her when she passes, when she soars above this mortal veil to become a holy angel there. So we have a prayer-like wish for the character Elizabeth, who's decided to sacrifice herself for the salvation and redemption of the title character Tannhäuser. Wolfram, who had a love interest in Elizabeth anyway, prays for her on her journey from this life to the afterlife, from earth to heaven. So how does Liszt portray this religious music at the beginning? He starts off uh, with his choice of key. Well, really, I should say it's Wagner's choice of key. Um, he uh, sets it in B major, which must have delighted Liszt, because Liszt, as we know, is a composer who liked to pair tonalities with different ways of being or different atmospheres. So for Liszt, B major is a holy key. It's usually the key of heaven, of a transcendental experience. So that goes together with the prayer-like nature of this text. In this opening music, which I call the intro before the intro, because really a recitative is like an introduction, but we have a few measures of music before that even begins, the list does another thing to make, uh, to draw out the holy uh, experience of this music. He sets it up way high. And that high up register also goes together with the um, high up geographic space of the text, if we're thinking of an evening star way up in the sky. And then lastly, as a performer, the last thing we want to keep in mind is that we probably don't want to mess with the timing of this music very much at all. We want to keep it pretty pure, simple, straight, devout, and not introduce a lot of rubato. Really, maybe no rubato at all into this. And I find that that's important to say because in Liszt, sometimes we have students or maybe even we ourselves see that name, Liszt, on the, uh, uh, as the composer's name. And then we take that as an invitation to play with a lot of exaggerated, highly romanticized rubato. Certainly there are pieces and passages where we do want to do that, but it's not just an immediate invitation to do so. Um, it's something that we want to be very judicious about, and it's always a matter of style and it's always a matter of taste and context. So here, the context is very simple, devout, holy. Let's keep it very hymn-like and limit any uh, messing with the pulse whatsoever. So let's take a listen to this intro before the intro. Following the intro before the intro, the rest of proper begins. And we're going to keep that idea of no rubato through with us in this next section. 
And well, actually, we think about rubato as being a backward motion of a kind of a lingering or a waiting most of the time. So I guess I am going to advocate for rubato in that I'm going to invite us to move through or push forward through the recit. And my reason for doing so has to do with that first philosophical problem I wanted to tackle in the recit, words and music. What we love about opera is that it's an art form that marries words and music and action. That's what separates it, for example, from a play. Um, but uh, historically, when we look at opera, we can often think about these two components, words and music, as being in a competitive, opposing relationship with one another. We can think of stories, for example, um, historically, where dramaturgists or directors stood in opposition to composers, each vying for um, dominance in a given passage. Is music more important here, or is the action and are the words more important here? So um, what that ended up being in the classical period for Mozart, if we want to think of a Mozart opera as our example, these different sections, recitative and aria. Um, in recit, we have often stock or somewhat uninspiring music that is set to words, and words have the dominant position there. Um, singers are going to push the plot forward. They're going to get a lot of words out and keep the action moving to just sort of generic uh, chordal accompaniment with a lot of space that allows for them to spit out those words. Then when we get to the aria or the romance in this instance from Wagner, um, we the music really gets the upper hand. And we have text, which is often just highly repetitive, where we camp out, so to speak, on one emotional experience of that character and the melody and the harmony and music making reign supreme there. So what are we to do then as a pianist when we actually don't even have words as an option? We know what the words are supposed to be, but unless this pianist is gonna sing from the piano, which we are probably not gonna do, uh, we really actually just have the music left. And so that's kind of um, creates a problem for us. The recit in this Wagnerless transcription is musically, I'm not going to call it uninspired, but um, it's just not about the music making the melody and the harmony um, alone. So um, what I'm going to suggest that we do is really move through it. We do not want to stop and smell the roses here. And this is an attitude, in fact, that Alan Walker recommends in his huge biography of Liszt. I believe he's talking about this sonata in B minor when he says, if we stop and smell the roses every single time we feel like we might want to, then that's going to bloat the whole work to, uh, it should be this length, but it's slowly going to become this length. And that's going to damage the structure of the form itself. So we don't want to be doing that. We don't want to be damaging uh, the structure of the work. And so I'm going to advocate for moving through this recit um, in a more spoken way. Anytime we have a singing line, we're just going to kind of push through in the way we might when we're as if we were speaking. That's going to allow us to luxuriate a bit more once we get to the romance. And I think that this whole conundrum is something that Liszt actually was sensitive to because he even gives us the option to make a cut from the intro before the intro all the way to the recit. So that is an option that we can always take as pianists or teachers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to demo uh, the beginning of the recit. I'm going to play a few measures. First, the way that I prefer to hear it, pushing through, and then I'm going to follow with what I believe we shouldn't do, which is taking time.
So we know how to play and how not to play in terms of timing. Uh, but that brings me to the second big topic I want to address in the reset, which has to do with texture, sound, and balance here. I have pretty strong feelings that, well, what you just heard me play, you probably heard me play the melodic line with a pretty powerful sound, especially compared to the uh, rest of the accompaniment, whether it was uh, blocked chords or arpeggiated chords, much tinier sound there. And um, I believe it's a kind of a genre convention. Whenever we're dealing with transcriptions of song literature or operatic literature, there's a genre convention um, that we're going to want to play the melody way bigger than the accompanimental chords that go along with it. This is different, for example, from a different genre. Let's take, for example, a Bach fugue. We're not going to want the voices to be quite so distant. Maybe we're going to want the balance to be much tighter and much closer. And even different voices are switching in and out of what's more important. Not so in this genre. We want to be playing with a huge sound in the melody in a relatively tiny sound in the accompanimental voices. Um, and this is a transferable skill. It's not just true for Wagner uh, transcriptions, although I believe it's a good example because Wagner, the Wagnerian voice that we know of is a voice type that is often really enormous and can really carry in a, in a big hall. So it's especially true here, but it's a transferable skill to all of our other song transcriptions too. So if you want to play your Schumann List Widmung or your Schubert List um, Erlkönig or any of these pieces, um, always we're going to want to keep the um, vocal line unequivocally larger. And I think that's what makes it such a good teaching choice, too. Not that I would give Erlkönig to a young pianist, but well, maybe your young students can do that. I don't know. Um, but uh, I think that subtlety, subtle shades, is something that comes to us usually later in life. The older we get, the more we can learn and appreciate those small variances. A young pianist, though, can latch on immediately to an exaggerated balance texture. Um, uh, so uh, what I just demonstrated, I hope... Uh, proves that or shows that, what I'm going to show now is how unsatisfactory and how unmoving the music is when we play with a sound that is not deep enough. So we know the end goal for our students is to learn how to play with the full weight of their arm. The f if they play with the full weight of their arm, it's going to translate into a sound which is big, round, beautiful, sonorous, all good things, a kind of good status quo sound for piano playing, and especially in this genre. So let's say we have a student that doesn't intuitively understand how to do that. We have, um, uh, I have a few of my favorite different ways to try to get the student to, um, to learn how to feel this. I often joke in my studio that teaching piano is basically an impossible task. So much of what we spend our time doing as teachers is trying to teach a student how they should feel inside their own body totally impossible, of course. So we do certain activities and we say certain words. It's going to try to make that light bulb moment happen and the student will go, aha, now I feel what I'm supposed to feel. So here are a few um, ideas for trying to get a student to feel how that feels to drop with the full weight of the arm. So m maybe you've heard of some of these um, in which case uh, that's fantastic. And it's very likely you have very many more ways to teach this um, uh, that I don't even bring up today. But um, option number one is uh, something I learned when I was rather young, which is to play standing up. It's kind of uncomfortable, but there seems to be nothing better to teach the arm to just sink and melt into the piano. So I'll stand up here and I don't know, maybe my head will be cut off in the camera, but um, I'll try to play the beginning of the rest sit from a standing position. And I should say even, it's in this version it's okay even to have the accompaniment voice play very deep and very heavy. 
I think the reason why this works is because it's so darn uncomfortable. It's um, you're actually really fighting gravity uh, in a huge kind of a way. And so the body at a certain point just gives up and yet there's no choice but to just sink your weight into the keyboard so that you don't have to fight against the discomfort of standing up and the wrist kind of like that. So that might help your student. Um, and I'll take another uh, thing from uh, like Maté tradition, Tobias Maté. Um, if your student is feeling very much like this, student shoulders up and afraid to make a sound, um, invite them to take their, uh, let's say, right hand and support it with the left hand. So no musculature is involved in keeping the right hand up. It's all in the left hand. And the left hand by now is already feeling how darn heavy the right arm is, our limbs are heavier than we realize. And then on the count of three, you're just going to drop it into your lap and you can count with them and do this with them. One, two, three. And you can do this over and over to until they really experience what it feels like to have totally dead arms that are not working at all. And then you can segue this to the piano and I often have them make a fist like this. And you get to go splat into the keyboard. Um, and sometimes timid students are so afraid to make a big sound, but you can try to say, I'm not going to criticize you for making your hand just drop straight into the sound and make a crashing sound. You can do it for them and demonstrate a few times to let them know it's okay to do this. You're not gonna hurt the piano. This instrument can deal with it, trust me. And then you can segue to doing that um, and uh, maybe you then, this is kind of a goofy, fun way of doing it, but then you can go back to playing the rest of it and say to your student, can you actually just make every single melody note with your fist and aim approximately? You're gonna hit a lot of cracks, that's okay. Um, let's see if I can show this. Something like that. Of course, we're not going to play that sloppy. It's just to get them to feel. Because when we make a fist and drop like this, it's almost like we have no other choice. Something about this, students understand what it feels like to drop with the full weight of the arm. And then, so we're going to scaffold. Now we're going to uh, pedagogically build it up to get closer and closer to just playing like a normal pianist. Next step, do the same thing. Save the position, uh, save the feeling in the arm, but only through your thumb. It's a little bit easier to feel the weight drop through the thumb than let's say some of the other smaller fingers. So that might look like this. step. Um, let's switch to convenient fingers, any finger you want, but save the non legato dropping approach. And then the last step is save the convenient fingering. Now segue to legato touch, but see if you can keep that feeling of dropping so that even as you connect fingers, you can kind of feel a whole arm drop too. Lastly, um, I'm going to end with the simplest thing, which is what I just demonstrated is a very kind of a cerebral pedagogical step-by-step -step method. Never underestimate the simple, which is just an image. Sometimes you can say everything you need to say, but the moment you say, play the piano like you're a 500 pound person, then they just get it and they intuitively know what to do. So you might have your favorite image. Sometimes I tell students to think, to pretend they've got an enormous weight tied right here, pulling the arm down, and that downward feeling helps them feel it. Uh, let your creativity run wild. To summarize, here's a list of practice techniques I just demonstrated to help a student find their sound with this piece. This list is by no means exhaustive. 
Rather, it's just a collection of techniques I use and frequently teach with in my own studio. So with that, we have everything we need to know to teach or to perform the rest it well. We know that we're going to play with a huge, deep singing projected tone on the melody, and we know that we are going to kind of push the music along because this is not the section of the piece to hold back and take time and linger and dwell over every single sweet note we play. Now we're going to fast forward to the end of the recit. Um, at the end of the recit, we get music that serves as a psychological musical trigger to take us back to the music from the intro before the intro. Both the music that Wagner wrote and the text begin with this reference up high to the evening star, prayer-like solemn, like a hymn. And then the recit, that makes sense why the recit music was so much lower. <laughs> because the imagery was the dark valley and premonition of death. And so the rest it ends, however, with the um, text and with the music that's much higher up, and that ushers in a pretty well-known passage of this piece. No um, discussion of Evening Star would be complete without some mention of the famous challenging tremolo section that ends the rest it. Orchestras can handle tremolos really well. It's particularly idiomatic for string players who just have to shake their bow arm back and forth, and it's a way to get a special texture or a sound effect where we can have one long chord sustain and so therefore get a sense of stasis and stillness while also agitating the sound and getting a kind of a shimmer or a sparkle to the sound. It's somewhat harder on the piano. We don't repeat quite as easily as those string players might. Um, it's an effect that Liszt loved. He wanted to make the piano sound as huge as a full orchestra. Um, his whole career, that was a kind of a career-long pursuit of his. And while he didn't invent the tremolo on the piano, he did uh, really expand it to something new. Um, I mentioned he didn't invent it. We can go all the way back to Beethoven Opus 26, the Funeral March Sonata, where in the Funeral March movement of that, Beethoven writes a tremolo uh, to get a kind of a sound effect like, um, I don't know, drummers playing, timpanist or something. And um, even he got that from the piano Steibelt. So it's uh, not a totally new effect, but one that Liszt really progressed through his uh, writing. So it poses a bit of a challenge both musically as, as well as technically, physically. So I gesture to my arm because this often tires a lot of pianists out. If they do it the wrong way, this is all tightened forearm and it can be impossible to get through a whole page of this kind of writing. Musically, it's a challenge too because sometimes certain notes don't come out and um, or one note comes out way too much and is so much louder than the others. And the basic trick to doing it well uh, the one approach that solves both technical and musical problems is to use forearm rotation. So in um, tightening and playing as fast as possible with finger flexion, we're going to for sure get uh, exhausted uh, or have notes not come together. If we use forearm rotation to this turning the key motion, uh, we will have a better shot at it. So the first thing I'm going to recommend is to keep the uh, rhythm very... Uh, straight and actually not freely shake as fast as possible, but rather measure it out and rhythmicize it. I've heard passionate arguments on both sides of the um, fence here about how a tremolo or a chill should be done, of the either measured or um, unmeasured. And here, I would say it's always a matter of context. And since we want this affect to be still and prayer-like, we should choose the measured out version. A teacher of mine, uh, taught me during my undergrad that if we want to make music sound agitated and uncomfortable, a good way to do that is disturb the pulse and keep it inconsistent. If we want to, on the other hand, project serenity, calm, a good way to do it is keep the pulse very predictable and the same. So here we want number two. We want that calmness. So um, I'm just going to, instead of shake as fast and freely as possible, 
which already you hear the F sharp was speaking louder than the other voices. I'm just going to measure it out as even 30 seconds. It's going to end up sounding a little bit slower, but more even, and it's going to feel better too. So how can we teach our students to do this well? How can we teach this for our rotation? After they've rhythmicized it, whenever we have a, a chord like this, a tremolo chord, we can always practice by verticalizing it and blocking it. That might sound like this. So that's one option. Or um, when we want to get to the um, tremolo itself, uh, we first begin by teaching to exaggerate. And the way I do this is I invite my students to imagine or to think they are showing their palm, the palm of their hand, to either wall. So when we do the rightward rotation, it's facing this wall. When we do the leftward rotation, palm is facing that wall. So, you know, here it's not really possible because the second finger is playing, but we're going to pretend. Turning the key backward and forward. Now let's say the student still isn't really conceptually understands that but can't make it happen. There are some ways we can practice to force it to happen. Um, try depressing the top note and just reattacking the bottom. We can even do this in time with the melody. Or the opposite. Lower two are depressed, I'm just going to reattack the top. notice my hand, the fingers are staying nice and straight, no fingers are curling up or freaking out or anything. When we do that, it forces the hand to feel this forearm rotation. You can also try leaving one note out, like what does it feel like when we leave the middle note out? Feels much easier. Actually, what if we leave out the lower note and just alternate that major third on top? All of these different ways of practicing will teach us something new about the passage, and hopefully the combination of all these practice techniques together will lend itself to um, a fluid and comfortable way of executing it. We can also always um, practice with rhythms and groupings. That's always something we can do when we have running 30 second notes in this case. Uh, we can also experiment with different fingering. So the obvious choice here, or maybe not obvious, but the most natural choice might be one, two on the bottom and four on top. We could also try it with five on the top and see how that changes things. We also shouldn't feel afraid to leave out the thumb. So the chord that's coming up is an E major chord, G sharp, B, E natural on top. Since the black key is the lowest note, maybe it feels uncomfortable to put our thumb there. We shouldn't feel afraid to try two, three together with five. Incidentally, I actually do finger this with thumb on the bottom, but the point is every hand is different and you shouldn't feel afraid to try. And then lastly, um, just like before, never underestimate the uh, power of an image. As I already said before with turning the key, um, if you can relate it to some gesture we do in real life, that might help um, it click a bit faster for your student. To summarize again, here's a list of practice techniques I suggest to help a student with trills and tremolos. These techniques should help with both clarity of execution as well as with ease and relaxation of execution. This list is again by no means exhaustive and only includes things that have helped me in the past and that I recommend to you. One last word about tremolos before we move on to the romance. Although we spent some time looking at practice techniques for refinement of right hand, we really shouldn't forget that the left hand is where the melody is here. So um, what we should do really is just play with such a huge, beautiful sound uh, in our left hand so as to distract or intoxicate the listener so they don't notice any insecurities we may have in the right hand. Together with that, um, the addition I play off of shows pretty long pedals, and I invite you to uh, play with as long pedals or maybe even longer pedals than you dare. Um, it's What we want to avoid is any kind of a stark change in harmony that's so obvious, like we're shimmering on B major and the pedal lifts up and there's a kind of a dry, obvious change to E major. I instead pedal by overlapping those harmonies, which results in a blur of about one or two or even three beats. 
And this goes together with a good rule of thumb in list playing that um, I learned of through um, Earl Wilde or something that apparently Earl Wilde said, which is in list, we should pedal so long um, or we should only change the pedal when we can't bear the sound anymore. It's a reminder that back then they would have pedaled uh, in a bit of a longer, blurrier way than we nowadays might find appropriate. So um, moving into the romance now, this is the section where we get to luxuriate in all of the, um, the rubato that we want. We've paid our dues, so to speak, and now we get to enjoy this big, beautiful melody. It is a wonderful teaching choice because of its very consistent um, harmonic tempo and the accompaniment pattern is comprised of a bass note and a chord that the student is likely to recognize and it inverts. So. Figures like that, which um, regardless of whether your student has had a little theory or a lot of theory, hopefully you've been working on these fundamentals of chord inversions with them. And um, it was it's pedagogically just kind of laid out in a clear, orderly way. So we know we get to play slower in the romance now, but how slow is too slow? Um, one thing that fascinated me when I started working on this piece was that I could hear a variety of different tempi work. So I could hear successfully a very slow tempo. Or I could also hear successfully a quicker tempo. And both of those could work. Wagner says sempre lento, ma un poco più mosso. So it's uh, how do we know which one to choose? So I went to YouTube and I listened to as many recordings as I could find. And I listened to both pianists and singers and I started to notice a discrepancy. Here's what I found. What we see here is a narrower range from singers huddled around a median number with pianists clocking in at a much wider range that show a big difference of interpretation. Perhaps the pianist wide range itself shows the complexity of the transcription problem. Nevertheless, the average tempo choice more or less matches between singers and pianists. Two problems should be noted with these lists. First, in every performance, there's so much rubato that it makes it difficult to decide on just one metronome marking. In most every case, the feeling of pulse changes every measure or two, and appropriately so for this style. Second, in every or nearly every case from a vocalist, one gets the impression that the singer would be singing much slower if unaccompanied. The orchestral accompaniment almost always has the effect of speeding the singer along, playing with a forward motion to counteract the singer's backward motion. Perhaps every metronome marking for the singers should be rounded down from what appears on this list, as these numbers better indicate what the orchestra is doing behind them. This data attempts to be quantitative, but for a qualitative description, I would say that pianists tend to, quote, flow, while singers tend to, quote, linger. In summary, although the numbers here might not fully capture it, I left my analysis convinced that singers are happier with a slower tempo, whereas pianists feel more comfortable with a slightly quicker tempo. So what accounts for this difference in tempo choice from pianists to singers? Well, the means of their instruments are totally different. I think it has to do with a number of things, but I'm thinking immediately of how a singer has to control their breath. They're constantly asking themselves how, you know, what's the start and end of a phrase? How long can my breath last? And how does it feel physically? 
to, to do this. Pianists don't have to worry about breath, but they have to worry about something else. They have to worry about the decay of their sound. The moment we strike a key, the sound's going to reach its apex and then decay after that. So a singer is, you know, better equipped to make a very convincing legato line because they can sustain a pitch as long as it holds or even grow through a pitch, a kind of a thing that pianists would probably kill to be able to do, to be able to crescendo through a held pitch. So this um, leads to philosophical problem number two here in this romance. Um, if we have these different means of making our instruments speak, what is our goal with the transcription process? Are we seeking to recreate the sound of the original instrumentation, no matter what? Or are we seeking to reimagine it for our own instrument, saying, I'm not in the business of recreating what a singer can do because I'm a pianist, and so I'm not even going to try. I'm going to play this work in the way that a pianist would play this work, not a singer. It's hard to argue with the logic of either of those. I think both can be correct. Um, but as interpreters, we have to take a stance and grapple with the issue one way or another. So what my choice is in this particular piece, again, it could be different in a different piece, but I'm more interested in this piece in recreating the sound of the original. I love the slow tempo where we just kind of caress and um, linger on every single note. To me, this has a closer connection with the text. You'll recall that the romance test uh, text is like a, a love song, a love prayer song from Wolfram to Elizabeth, and I think that the slower tempo goes together uh, better with that text. So um, when I, I decide I want to keep a slow tempo, to me there's this like sound tempo continuum. The slower I go, the more I need that huge round genre convention big sound for a transcription so that I play loud enough that any given melody note can last. It has enough juice to last to its next melody note. If I want to play quicker, I don't need to play it so loud on every single melody note because the next note's going to come sooner than it would in a slow tempo. So we have this continuum and you get to decide where you want to be on the, um, where you want to slide to on the continuum. For me, the text generates my approach, and so I'm going to play with this as big of a sound as I can get away with, and as slow of a tempo, really, as I can get away with. So we've talked about what tempo we should choose, and what sound we should choose, and that brings me to my final pedagogical point for this piece today. Um, I think that this piece is an excellent choice for teaching students about color change based on harmony. In an ideal world, we are following all of the expression markings and everything in this score to the letter of the law. Um, but as you and I both know, there are always additional things that we should bring to the table. There are sometimes um, uh, harmonic changes from one predictable chord to an unpredictable chord that we want to sound like we are reacting to and aware of. So since this piece, as I said, has a very predictable and uniform accompaniment pattern, uh, harmonic tempo and so forth, it makes it a particularly good candidate to talk about color change. Now, I remember when I was a younger pianist being totally perplexed by this idea of color change. The premise didn't make any sense to me. Color is something you see, music is something you listen to. So there's this kind of cross-sensory sensory confusion I had as a little kid. And it was just kind of a term that I remember came up in piano lessons, and I felt like it was never actually explained to me what it meant. It very well could be that it was explained to me and I just forgot. But in any case, um, we should be really clear with our language, with students, what that means. Color change is something that we talk about all the time, but a student might not know what we're talking about and may feel frustrated. I think, in essence, what we're talking about with color change um, is a change in the quality of the sound and put very, very simply for our young students, this is often a suddenly louder or suddenly softer quality of sound that we're choosing to mark a musical event as significant or different. Yes, we could talk about the same kind of decibel level with a different quality of sound. That subtlety, I worry, it might be lost on a younger student. So we're going to focus on playing either suddenly louder or suddenly softer. And in a kind of a storytelling way, we should be um, uh, inflecting different chord and harmony changes with this color change. The difficult part for a student is that this is seldom indicated in the score. We have to decide when to do it for ourselves. For our first example, recall the introduction to the romance, which I just played. 
we see in these first three measures a generic chordal accompaniment being set up before the main theme. The first measure is in C minor with an accented high note of E flat. The second measure an inversion of E flat dominant seventh, again E flat accented as the top note. And this resolves in measure three to tonic A flat major in root position. The goal here for a young student is to hear the relationship between three E flats, the first two that are in the score, and the third imaginary. Since E flat is a chord member of A flat major, we can perceive its continuation into that third measure, even though Liszt changes the accompaniment pattern slightly to omit the accented high E flat. So we can ask our students, should these three E flats sound similar? On the page, in terms of dynamics and expression markings, the first two look identical. However, they're not identical because the harmony underneath is different, and the harmony is the greater tool for expression while expression markings, articulation, and dynamics are all the lesser tools for expression. We can choose the level of complexity to match our students' understanding of music theory. If our students aren't yet to Roman numerals and functional harmony, we can leave the discussion above to the line here in this slide, looking at the differences between chord qualities like major, minor, dominant seventh, diminished, and so forth. Or if our students have a bit more theory, the still richer conversation is in the function and personalities of these chords pictured below the line. The minor harmony has long associations of stress, darkness, and worry, so perhaps we play that E flat louder. The second E flat is in a major minor seventh chord, which contains the highly dissonant tritone interval inside of it. Not only that, but it is here presented as a dominant seventh of the home key, representing the point of utmost tension, wishing so badly to resolve to the home key, like a rubber band pulled back between our fingers, stretched back as far as it can go to the point of ultimate anticipation before slingshot release. For that reason, perhaps we color this E flat softer, but still present to capture that feeling of tension and desire. Finally, the major mode and especially tonic key functions as a resolution that should feel like the relief of coming home after a stressful day out of the house. It's a good rule of thumb to play the tonic chord of resolution softer than its preceding dominant chord. What results is a basic dynamic shape of diminuendo that tells the story of the harmonies themselves, so to speak. This diminuendo, diminuendo isn't in the score, and that's okay. Something I often repeat to my students is that we really should never take anything out of the score, but it is our responsibility to add things like this into the score to give musical lines a shape. Let's keep looking for opportunities to use repeated pitches to teach about color change. So in the last example, we use the E flat re repeating uh, three times to talk about uh, color change based off of what harmony the E flat was floating over. Repeated notes are a great way to do this because the uh, student gets the sense of same but different. The pitch is the same, but the supporting harmony is different. So it kind of casts it um, into a uh, sets it into relief, so to speak. Just a few measures later, we have another opportunity for this over now the pitch A flat. Uh, I'll play for you. Right here, A flat over flat six changes to A flat over a uh, fully diminished 7-7 seven, seven of 5. And so a fully diminished chord is um, uh, fraught with anxiety and worry and, and concern and angst. And a flat 6 as a harmony here, so that would be F flat major in the key home key of A flat major. Flat 6 is like otherworldly, um, transformational, uh, starry-eyed kind of wonder key. So these two A flats, although they look the same in the score, have absolutely nothing to do with each other. Um, they should be played very differently. And where the opera singer has text to communicate narrative and story, we don't have that as pianists, but we do still have color change. So we can inflect these tones differently to kind of tell a story as if the character is singing about something wonderful and wondrous that flat six would indicate. But then once we hear that harmony change, we know that there's kind of a change of a way of being or a change of thought or perspective that carries the plot in a different direction. So here it is one more time. All 
I did, simply put, was play the second A flat and its chord much softer. And just that is enough to um, make it sound like we're reacting to the harmonies rather than just reciting what's on the page. The last thing that we can choose to do to try to storytell from the keyboard using color change is to look at form, expectations of form. Appearing here is a rough diagram of the form of the romance's main theme. On top are measure numbers, and below it are given thematic content, harmonies, Roman numerals, cadence points, and suggestions for emotions that match the mood at that point. Charting something like this can help a student memorize a piece, but more interesting to me is that it charts a sort of storyline in and of itself. Every eight measures, Wagner sets up musical cues for successful, unproblematic closure in A-flat major. In fact, eight measures is often a good length for a balanced, tight-knit theme. Yet Wagner constantly blocks closure at these expected points. What's remarkable about this melody is that Wagner spins it out to 33 measures before full closure occurs, showing us Wagner's special gift of endless melody. As performers, each of these cadential moments give us the opportunity to try to project an emotion suggested by the harmonies themselves. There's an okay arrival in measure eight, followed by a missed arrival and another missed arrival with a big setup to a final successful arrival in measure 33. If a student gains nothing from this study other than the fact that harmonies themselves mean something, then it will have been a success. And in this genre, we can always check our work, so to speak, by comparing the meaning of the harmonies to the meaning of the text. We see in the romance text from earlier that, in fact, each line builds up to a climax. It is only in the last two lines that Wolfram finally indicates that Elizabeth is going to die. And it's in a heroic major key moment, because you'll recall that this favorite thematic device of Wagner's is more about the salvation of a man that occurs as a result of the death of a woman. The fact that Wagner does this again and again in his operas is obviously very problematic, but is something outside the scope of this pedagogical video. So that's the big arrival at the end. But what about all those missed arrivals earlier? In terms of punctuation alone, we do see many commas with stops and starts in the text. Is Wolfram hesitating because he doesn't want to utter that his love interest Elizabeth will die? Or are those deceptive cadences painful reminders to Wolfram of the reality of her situation, interjecting while he tries to focus on Tannhäuser's salvation? These are discussions to have with the student. The goal of this way of playing and listening is such that we want the student and the performer to perform and share the music as if they're thinking it up at the at that moment, that everything they do has a kind of a meaning. Um, this is sometimes referred to in piano pedagogy as, oh, the student really is listening to themselves. That's always hard for a student to understand because they hear themselves for sure. They might not know the difference between hearing and listening, but they think, of course, I am listening to myself. I listen to myself right now. So if we can, again, be more specific with language, I think what we're actually getting after is um, if a person uh, can perform with this way, to me, it denotes understanding. Uh, rather than just repetition. So I can liken it to it. I can use an analogy here. We've all, I think, probably either heard another person or been in the position of reading something aloud and maybe even imagine reading something in a foreign language, one that you don't speak. Even if you know the pronunciation rules for that language, you can read the text and it's going to sound like basically all the words make sense and are pronounced correctly, but if you don't know the meaning of the language itself, all of the thoughts are not going to string together in a conversational, easy to understand way. It's going to sound kind of stilted and accurate, but actually not really that accurate. It's the same with music, which is kind of like a language in and of itself. It's uh, quite common to hear young, young pianists even developing their technical gifts in advance of their musical understanding gifts of what, um, what these chords and harmonies might actually mean. I hope to have convinced listeners today that recitative and romance, Evening Star, makes for a fantastic repertoire choice for early advanced pianists. Technically, the piece builds off of fundamentals a student likely already knows, like chord inversions and arpeggio figures. But the piece really shines in its ability to help us teach musicality and interpretation to our students. 
One, in opera transcriptions, the clarity of the narrative or plot helps give our students concrete guidance on how to play the piece. Two, the genre itself often succeeds from exaggerating the balance of the melodic line. If we take subtle shades and inflections to be the harder, more refined skill, this exaggeration should come easier to a young pianist. Three, we get to teach our students operatic vocab like recitative and aria, and even teach a little more opera 101 if the student is interested. Then we get to have a discussion about how that impacts our tempo as pianists. Four, for the pianist philosophers among us, we get to consider in this piece the degree to which we hope to replicate exactly how a singer might perform this work. Not only the role of text as discussed before, but also vocal ideas like breath control, diction, and legato through sustained notes should keep us curious about how we hope to inflect each phrase. Or, not at all if we reject the notion that it's an exercise in copying another instrument. Five. This piece allows us to teach about phrases like color change in a more specific and focused way. With a steady harmonic rhythm comprised of highly recognizable chords, the student can learn that these changing harmonies mean something. This same meaning can then be compared or corroborated with the original romance text. The teacher has the ability to draw in lightly or very heavily for music theory in these discussions, depending on the student's level and interest. Thank you for tuning in today for this exploration of the Wagner List Evening Star transcription. I hope that you found what I found, which is that this piece offers us a lot of interesting points and a lot of interesting conversations to explore music making and makes for a great pedagogical choice for our early advanced students. I hope that you feel satisfied through it and are uh, leaving here very unafraid to assign the lyrical transcriptions that List has given to us. Thanks. Take care. Thank you.